I've been working on an understanding of charcoal for about a decade, so I'm something of authority, something of an authority on charcoal. I've read every single research paper published on it, and I, I suppose I know quite a lot about it. I'm particularly interested in one type of charcoal, which is C60, the molecule C60. It's a, a geodesic form. Um, consequently, all of the uh, all of the children, the daughters of C60, are known as fullerenes. And the fullerene molecule is odd because it's it's a, as I said, it's a dome, um, it's rather like a football, and it has the capability of taking in a chlorophyll molecule or a hematite molecule, an iron molecule. In the one form. It is the precursor of plant life, and in the other form, it's the precursor of mammalian life. Um, the big advantage with C60 is it's totally compatible with living forms. It can be absorbed and used in their structures, but it can have no deleterious effect. The, the great beauty of it is that it's capable of absorbing or binding to itself a vast number of toxins, about 4,000 known toxins, so that charcoal made up of this rather special molecule is the best possible filtration subject known to man. They use it in submarines and in space stations and <clears throat> in all manner of, almost every form of filtration unit that you can think of. The filter jugs that you buy to filter tap water are packed with active charcoal. Now, charcoal can be of two forms, well it can be of dozens of forms and dozens of, of uh, derivations, but the two main forms are ordinary charcoal and activated charcoal. Activated charcoal is charcoal which has been made by a process whereby they cook usually, um, it's made up of um, coconut shells, cooked at several thousand degrees centigrade with steam and then um, acid washed to, to come to the final product. So it's a highly industrialised product. It's very, very adsorbent, much too adsorbent in my view, for use in mammal systems, or for use over a longish period. It's fine for short-term use, to take toxins out, but it's not good for long-term use. The other kind of charcoal, and one which I specialise in, is derived from hardwood, which is the highest proportion of the C60 molecule in, that we're aware of on this planet, um, and that form of charcoal is once again a buckyball, a fullery in a C60 uh, molecule, but it works at a normal um, level, it works at a normal pace. That is to say, it isn't aggressively absorbing everything, it's just absorbing things at, a, at an organic rate. I think that's much better because that's what we evolved with. And we evolved using this particular charcoal for several thousand years as part of our diet. I say that because, um, well, 35,000 years ago, our ancestors were using this charcoal to make handprints on the top of the caves in southern France, where the um, early cro magnon civilization did all those wonderful cave paintings. Up on the ceiling, you'll see several hundred handprints, which are put there with great difficulty because it's 30 feet up and for some purpose I know not what. But the only way you can do that, you can outline a hand like that, is to take a quantity of charcoal, take some water into your mouth, chew it up really fine and go <laughs> around the imprint of the hand. I, I don't know why they were doing it, I wish I did, but um, that's, that, that shows that we were using charcoal an awful long time ago. I believe actually that this C60 charcoal is a fundamental molecule involved in our evolution because I think that as um, bipedal primates we, were, we would walk around the place eating shoots and roots and nuts and flowers and um, all manner of berries and that kind of thing and because of the very high amount of uh, secondary compounds in a lot of the things that we ate, secondary compounds are poisons uh, which plants put in their leaves to protect themselves because there's a high incidence of secondary compounds, um, we would have begun to eat charcoal to settle our stomachs and to take the poison out. 
And you see that behaviour in the monkeys in Madagascar to this day. They'll steal charcoal from the charcoal burners' fires or from their packs and eat it um, because their diet is preponderantly lantana and that has a lot of secondary compounds in it. So they know that by eating the charcoal they're self-medicating. They're keep, keeping themselves clear of poisons. And you get a number of instances like that. Um, species of pig does it with kale and clay in the Amazon. But a lot of animals use charcoal in that way. But in our long evolutionary history, I believe we would have used charcoal a great deal in that form. And by seeking for charcoal, we'll have gone to, to parts of the forest which were burned down to, to harvest the charcoal, found animals that had been caught in the fire and cooked, and begun to taste these things, found that they, they tasted quite nice, they were quite easy to digest, and because of that ease of digestion, we'll have sought out a burned out forest to find these dead animals to eat, soon after the fire had gone. Um, meat gives a higher level of energy. It also brings with it dozens of problems, but it brings with it a higher level of energy, and Therefore, you don't have to eat as much. You don't have to eat 83% of the time as we did prior to that. You eat, well, more or less when you can, but you're not eating all the time. Consequently, you've got leisure. And with leisure comes curiosity. With curiosity comes tool use. And slowly comes a bigger brain. So I think that we owe charcoal. One of the stepping stones to our large brain is charcoal. It's just my theory, but no way of proving it. Um, but it's an interesting theory anyway. Going back to the use of charcoal to this day, we ingest quite accidentally 200,000 different poisons that we've made in our chemical industries over the last 50 to 200 years. Um, we don't know how our bodies handle these. We know that the liver can't handle them very well. and We know that our liver tends to park them in fat around the body, so the fat becomes toxic. And we have no defence against these toxins. They are part of the food chain now. They're in our water, they're in our preserved foods particularly. There's no way of protecting against these but by taking charcoal. You have to have charcoal in your diet in order to take out the thousands of toxins to which you are subjected every day. And not a very nice thought, but basically what you're doing is filtering yourself. Uh, you're filtering your blood. Um, and you're filtering um, the toxins out as they go through your system. And a chap called Frokis in Russia has proved that mice live an awful lot longer if they're fed charcoal as part of their diet. And there's all sorts of research which shows quite clearly that charcoal prolongs life. And if you think about it, if your immune system doesn't have to fight quite so hard against all these toxins it's taking in, then it can do its job better and you can live longer and that's my approach to uh, taking charcoal. I take prodigious amounts, I'm 73, I'm fit and well, I don't suffer from any of the diseases of old age and I don't intend to. I take a lot of other things as well but that's by the by. One of the main dietary influences I have is charcoal. I developed a form of charcoal which I find much more compatible with me and with all the friends that I give it to and that is I found a way of treating the charcoal so that the forces on the surface of the charcoal bind more strongly and I don't cook it at thousands of degrees it's a physical process what charcoal does is it binds uh, molecules of other substances to its surface it seems to do it selectively I have no good explanation as to why but it seems to bind mainly toxins it doesn't bind proteins and it doesn't bind any of the secondary any of the things that are good for us. It seems to reduce competition at the cell wall for nutrients, so you actually get better nutrition when you're taking charcoal. You do better from your ordinary diet. And this this effect is achieved by strengthening the Van der Waal forces. Van der Waal forces or London forces are what um, charcoal uses to bind toxins to its surface. Because charcoal is fundamentally cooked wood, it has thousands of crenellations and 
pores and crevasses, so much so that one centimetre square of charcoal would flatten out to something approximating the size of a tennis court. And if that's hard to grasp, take a, a large piece of silver paper and scrunch it up to a very small ball and you'll see what I'm talking about. That huge surface area is embodied in a very small amount of charcoal. By milling the charcoal up into 0.5 to 1 milligram, 0.5 to 1 mil um, granules, it's, it's increasing the surface area yet further and making it that more biocompatible. Um, in the human body, it does strange things because the human body <coughs> is, a, is an electromagnetic system. All of the neural signals are uh, electronic or magnetic. Um, this enhances the effect of the charcoal. So I took that knowledge and I've, asked, I've enhanced it slightly further in a process which I won't tell you about. Um, which makes the charcoal that we use that much more effective and yet not as absorbent as the activated charcoal which I shun. So the best thing I can say to you, <coughs> if you want to live longer, digest your food better, settle your stomach and have done with things like irritable bowel syndrome, Crohn's disease, colitis, acid reflux, then you should certainly try taking charcoal, you'll find that it helps enormously. It doesn't cure anything, it doesn't have any physical or chemical reactions. Well, it doesn't have any chemical reactions in the body, um, so it's not a medicine. It's a feed additive, but added to your feed, it will make you a damn sight more, it will help you become a damn sight more healthy. I hope that helps.